The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, Chapter 11. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. Edited by Frank Woodworth Pine. Chapter 12. Defense of the Province. I had on the whole abundant reason to be satisfied with my being established in Pennsylvania. There were, however, two things that I regretted, there being no provision for defense, nor for a complete education of youth, no militia, nor any college. I therefore, in 1743, drew up a proposal for establishing an academy, and at that time, thinking the Reverend Mr. Peters, who was out of employ, a fit person to superintend such an institution, I communicated the project to him, but he, having more profitable views in the service of the proprietaries, which succeeded, declined the undertaking, and, not knowing another at that time suitable for such a trust, I let the scheme lie a while dormant. I succeeded better the next year, 1744, in proposing and establishing a philosophical society. The paper I wrote for that purpose will be found among my writings when collected, with respect to defence, Spain having been several years at war against Great Britain, and being at length joined by France, which brought to us great danger, and the laboured and long-continued endeavour of our governor, Thomas, to prevail with our Quaker assembly to pass a militia law, and make other provisions for the security of the province, having proved abortive, I determined to try what might be done by a voluntary association of people. To promote this, I first wrote and published a pamphlet entitled Plain Truth, in which I stated our defenseless situation in strong lights, with the necessity of union and discipline for our defense, and promised to propose in a few days an association to be generally signed for that purpose. The pamphlet had a sudden and surprising effect. I was called upon for the instrument of association, and having settled the draft of it with a few friends, I appointed a meeting of the citizens in the large building before mentioned. The house was pretty full. I had prepared a number of printed copies and provided pens and ink, dispersed all over the room. I harangued them a little on the subject, read the paper, and explained it, and then distributed the copies, which were eagerly signed not the least objection being made. When the company separated and the papers were collected, we found about twelve hundred hands, and other copies being dispersed in the country, the subscribers amounted at length to upwards of ten thousand. These all furnished themselves as soon as they could with arms, formed themselves into companies and regiments, chose their officers, and met every week to be instructed in the manual exercise, and other parts of military discipline. The women, by subscription among themselves, provided silk colors, which they presented to the companies, painted with different devices and mottoes, which I supplied. The officers of the companies, composing the Philadelphia Regiment, being met, chose me for their colonel, but, conceiving myself unfit, I declined that station and recommended Mr. Lawrence, a fine person and a man of influence, who was accordingly appointed. I then proposed a lottery to defray the expense of building a battery below the town and furnishing it with cannon. It filled expeditiously, and the battery was soon erected, with Merlin's being framed of logs and filled with earth. We bought some old cannon from Boston, but these not being sufficient, we wrote to England for more soliciting at the same time our proprietaries for the assistance, though without much expectation of obtaining it. Meanwhile, Colonel Lawrence, William Allen, Allen Taylor, Esquire, and myself were sent to New York by the Associators, commissioned to borrow some cannon of Governor Clinton. He first refused us peremptorily, but at dinner with his council, where there was great drinking of Madeira wine, as the custom of that place then was. He softened by degrees, and said he would lend us six. After a few more bumpers he advanced to ten, and at length he very good-naturedly conceded eighteen. They were fine cannon, eighteen-pounders, with their carriages, 
which were soon transported and mounted on our battery, where the associators kept a nightly guard while the war lasted, and among the rest I regularly took my turn of duty there as a common soldier. My activity in these operations was agreeable to the governor and council. They took me into confidence, and I was consulted by them in every measure wherein their concurrence was thought useful to the association. Calling in the aid of religion, I proposed to them the proclaiming a fast to promote reformation and implore the blessing of heaven on our undertaking. They embraced the motion, but as it was the first fast ever thought of in the province, the secretary had no precedent from which to draw the proclamation. My education in New England, where a fast is proclaimed every year, was here of some advantage. I drew it in the accustomed style. It was translated into German, printed in both languages, and divulged through the province. This gave the clergy of the different sects an opportunity of influencing their congregation to join in the association, and it would probably have been general among all but Quakers if the peace had not soon intervened. Begin footnote. William Penn's agents sought recruits for the colony of Pennsylvania in the low countries of Germany, and there are still in eastern Pennsylvania many Germans, inaccurately called Pennsylvania Dutch. Many of them use a Germanized English. End of footnote. It was thought by some of my friends that by my activity in these affairs I should offend that sect, and thereby lose my interest in the assembly of the province, where they formed a great majority. A young gentleman, who had likewise some friends in the house, and wished to succeed me as their clerk, acquainted me that it was decided to displace me at the next election, and he therefore in good will advised me to resign as more consistent with my honour than being turned out. My answer to him was that I had read or heard of some public man who had made it a rule never to ask for an office, and never to refuse one when offered to him. I approve, says I, of his rule, and will practice it with a small addition. I shall never ask, never refuse, nor ever resign an office." If they will have my office of clerk to dispose of to another, they shall take it from me. I will not, by giving it up, lose my right of some time or other making reprisals on my adversaries. I heard, however, no more of this. I was chosen again unanimously, as usual, at the next election. Possibly, as they disliked my late intimacy with the members of council, who had joined the governors in all the disputes about military preparations, with which the house had long been harassed, they might have been pleased if I would voluntarily have left them, but they did not care to displace me on account merely of my zeal for the association, and they could not well give another reason. Indeed I had some cause to believe that the defense of the country was not disagreeable to any of them, provided they were not required to assist in it and I found that a much greater number of them than I could have imagined, though against offensive war, were clearly for the defensive. My pamphlets, pro and con, were published on the subject, and some by good Quakers in favor of defense, which I believe convinced most of their younger people. A transaction in our fire company gave me some insight into their prevailing sentiments. It had been supposed that we should encourage the scheme for building a battery by laying out the present stock, then about sixty pounds, in tickets of the lottery. By our rules, no money could be disposed of till the next meeting after the proposal. The company consisted of thirty members, of which twenty-two were Quakers, and eight only of other persuasions. We eight punctuously attended the meetings, but though we thought that some of the Quakers would join us, we were by no means sure of a majority. Only one Quaker, Mr. James Morris, appeared to oppose the measure. He expressed much sorrow that it had ever been proposed, as he said, friends were all against it, and it would create such discord as might break up the company. We told him that we saw no reason for that. We were the minority, and if friends were against the measure, and outvoted us, we must and should agreeably to the usage of all societies 
submit. When the hour for business arrived and was moved to put to the vote, he allowed we might then do it by the rules. But as he could assure us that a number of members had intended to be present for the purpose of opposing it, it would be but candid to allow a little time for their appearing. While we were disputing this, a waiter came to tell me two gentlemen below desired to speak with me. I went down and found they were two of our Quaker members. They told me there were eight of them assembled at a tavern just by, and that they were determined to come and vote with us if there should be occasion, which they hoped would not be the case, and desired we should not call for their assistance if we could do without it, as their voting for such a measure might embroil them with their elders and friends. Being thus secure of a majority, I went up, and after a little seeming hesitation, agreed to a delay of another hour. This Mr. Morris allowed to be extremely fair. Not one of his opposing friends appeared, at which he expressed great surprise, and at the expiration of the hour we carried the resolution eight to one, and as of the twenty-two Quakers, eight were ready to vote with us, and thirteen by their absence manifested that they were not inclined to oppose the measure. I afterward estimated the proportion of Quakers sincerely against the defense as one to twenty-one only, for these were all regular members of that society, and in good reputation among them, and had due notice of what was proposed at that meeting. The honorable and learned Mr. Logan, who had always been of that sect, was one who wrote an address to them, declaring his approbation of defensive war, and supporting his opinion by many strong arguments. He put into my hand sixty pounds to be laid out in lottery tickets for the battery, with directions to apply what prize might be drawn wholly to that service. He told me the following anecdote of his old master, William Penn, respecting defense. He came over from England when a young man, with that proprietary, and as his secretary. It was wartime, and their ship was chased by an armed vessel supposed to be an enemy. Their captain prepared for defense, but told William Penn and his company of Quakers that he did not expect their assistance, and they might retire into the cabin, which they did, except James Logan, who chose to stay upon deck and was quartered to a gun. The supposed enemy proved a friend, and there was no fighting, but when the secretary went down to communicate the intelligence, William Penn rebuked him severely for staying upon deck and undertaking to assist in defending the vessel, contrary to the principles of friends, especially as it had not been required by the captain. This reproof being before all the company, piqued the secretary, who answered, I, being thy servant, why did thee not order me to come down? But thee was willing enough that I should stay and help to fight the ship when thee thought there was danger. Begin footnote. James Logan, 1674 to 1751, came to America with William Penn in 1699, and was the business agent for the Penn family. He bequeathed his valuable library, preserved at his county seat, Senton, to the city of Philadelphia. End footnote. By being many years in the assembly, the majority of which were constantly Quakers, gave me frequent opportunities of seeing the embarrassment given them by their principle against war. Whenever application was made to them, by order of the Crown, to grant aids for military purposes, they were unwilling to offend government on the one hand by a direct refusal, and their friends, the body of the Quakers, on the other, by compliance contrary to their principles, hence a variety of evasions to avoid complying, and modes of disguising the compliance when it became unavoidable. The common mode at last was to grant money under the phrase of its being for the king's use, and never to inquire how it was applied. But if the demand was not directly from the crown, that phrase was found not so proper, and some other was to be invented, as when powder was wanting, I think it was for the garrison at Lewisburg, and the government of New England solicited a grant of some from Pennsylvania, which was much urged on the house by Governor Thomas. They could not grant money to buy powder, because that was an ingredient of war, 
but they voted an aid to new england of three thousand pounds to be put into the hands of the governor and appropriated it for the purchase of bread flour wheat or other grain some of the council desirous of giving the house still further embarrassment advised the governor not to accept provision as not being the thing he had demanded but he replied i shall take the money for i understand very well their meaning other grain is gunpowder which he accordingly bought and they never objected to it it was an allusion to this fact that when in our fire company we feared the success of our proposal in favour of the lottery and i had said to my friend mr singh one of our members if we fail let us move the purchase of a fire engine with the money the quakers can have no objection to that and then if you nominate me and i you as a committee for that purpose we will buy a great gun which is certainly a fire engine i see says he you have improved by being so long in the assembly your equivocal project would be just a match for their wheat or other grain these embarrassments that the quakers suffered from having established and published it as one of their principles that no kind of war was lawful and which being once published they could not afterwards however they might change their mind easily get rid of reminds me of what i think a more prudent conduct in another sect among us that of the dunkers i was acquainted with one of its founders michael welfare soon after it appeared he complained to me that they were grievously calumated by the zealots of other persuasions and charged with the abominable principles and practices to which they were utter strangers i told him this had always been the case with new sects and that to put a stop to such abuse i imagined it might be well to publish the articles of their belief and the rules of their discipline he said it had been proposed among them but not agreed to for this reason when we were first drawn together as a society he said it had pleased god to enlighten our minds so far as to see some doctrines which we once esteemed truths were errors and that others which we had esteemed errors were real truths from time to time he has been pleased to afford us further light and our principles have been improving and our errors diminishing now we are not sure that we are arrived at the end of this progression and at the perfection of spiritual or theological knowledge and we fear that if we should once print our confession of faith we should feel ourselves as if bound and confirmed by it and perhaps be unwilling to receive further improvement and our successors still more so as conceiving what we their elders and founders have done to be something sacred never to be departed from this modesty in a sect is perhaps a singular instance in the history of mankind every other sect supposing itself in possession of all truth and that those who differ are so far in the wrong like a man travelling in foggy weather those at some distance before him on the road he sees wrapped up in the fog as well as those behind him and also the people in the fields on each side but near him all appears clear though in truth he is as much in the fog as any of them to avoid this kind of embarrassment the quakers have of late years been gradually declining the public service in the assembly and in the magistracy, choosing rather to quit their power than their principle in order of time i should have mentioned before that having in seventeen forty two invented an open stove for the better warming of rooms and at the same time saving fuel as the fresh air admitted was warmed in entering i made a present of the model to mr robert grace one of my early friends who having an iron furnace found the casting of the plates for these stoves a profitable thing as they were growing in demand to promote that demand i wrote and published a pamphlet entitled an account of the new invented pennsylvania fireplaces wherein their construction and manner of operation is particularly explained their advantages above every other method of warming rooms demonstrated and all objections that have been raised against the use of them answered and obviated etc this pamphlet had a good effect governor thomas was so pleased with the construction of this stove 
as described in it that he offered to give me a patent for the sole vending of them for a term of years but i declined it from a principle which has ever weighed with me on such occasions viz that as we enjoy great advantages from the inventions of others we should be glad of an opportunity to serve others by any invention of ours and thus we should do freely and generously begin footnote the franklin stove is still in use warwick furnace chester county pennsylvania across the shishkul river from potsdam End footnote an ironmonger in london however assumed a good deal of my pamphlet and working it up into his own and making some small changes in the machine which rather hurt its operation got a patent for it there and made as i was told a little fortune by it and this is not the only instance of patents taken out for my inventions by others though not always with the same success which i never contested as having no desire of profiting by patents myself and hating disputes the use of these fireplaces in very many houses both of this and the neighbouring colonies has been and is a great saving of wood to the inhabitants End of chapter twelve